You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast brought to you by Vessi Seeds. And today we've got soil scientist Keith Reed to talk to us about the colonization of Mars and how we're going to feed all those people. Who's Keith Reed? Uh, Keith was raised on a mixed farm in Bruce County, Ontario, studied soil science and got a master's degree from the University of Guelph. His career encompassed farming, agribusiness, agricultural extension, and R&D, uh, working for the federal government. And he's currently retired, enjoys uh, puttering around the garden, and he has a great book on soil, which I've had him on this podcast to talk about, Improving Your Soil. It's a great book. We had a number of, I think we did at least two episodes of this book, and I think we did another episode with people just asking you questions and you answering them about soil. Is that right, Keith? I remember we did two. Okay. Uh, we may have done the uh the Q&A. If we didn't, we should, because it's uh, there's always lots of questions. Yeah, there's always lots of questions. <laughs> uh, so before we get started, how about uh, just, just say hello, Keith, and uh, whatever I haven't told people about yourself, maybe uh, just, just throw at us. Yep. Great to be here. Uh, it's an interesting topic. We're, we're talking about, you know, colonizing Mars and uh, you know, I've been I've been a space nut since I was in short pants. So <laughs> it uh, it's a long way away from the backyard garden, yes. but it's uh, something that yeah, it's worth thinking about. Okay, so uh, I thought I'd tee this up by there's a lot of interest in this. People are talking about it, and uh, I thought I'd read something from the SpaceX website. So why Mars? Uh, at an average distance distance of 140 million miles. Mars is one of Earth's closest habitable neighbors. Mars is about half again as far from the sun as Earth is, so it still has a decent sunlight. It is a little cold, but we can warm it up. Its atmosphere is primarily CO2 with some nitrogen and argon and a few other trace elements, which means we can grow plants on Mars just by compressing the atmosphere. Mar gravity on Mars is about 38% of that on Earth, so you would be able to lift heavy things and bound around. Well, wow, isn't that great? Um, furthermore, the day is remarkably close to that of Earth. Okay, so <laughs> I've been thinking about this sort of thing. And the thing I keep coming back to is the idea that, you know, if we could go back 2,000 years, okay? And let's say we had uh, a, a fantastic sailboat and we could take 100 teenagers, okay? 50 males, 50 females, teenagers, okay? And this is not very educated teenagers. Teenagers, I thought, you know, 2,000 years ago. And we took them in a boat, and we took them to a beautiful place like Tahiti or Cuba or someplace like that. And we just dropped them off, no adults, with whatever they knew at that point in time on a beautiful, lush island like that with, let's say, there was no people there at the time, so they had the place to themselves. And we just left them there. I would wager to guess that there's a high probability that there would still be people there now, descended from those people. Uh, whereas if we did the same thing, we took a bunch of teenagers, 100 teenagers, dropped them off on Mars. <laughs> now, different proposition. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of where I am with this. You know, this is the, whole, the whole idea of colonizing Mars is a, a we have to think about this differently than colonizing uh, some part of Earth, which is our only experience with, we've only ever had colonies here, okay? So uh, I've had a few emails back and forth with Keith, who is a soil scientist. So the idea is if, if you're gonna have some people on Mars, you gotta feed them. I mean, there's one thing if people just go there and they bring a bunch of stuff with them, you know, stored food, and they're just living off of that. But it's a whole nother thing if there's gonna be people there and they don't need Earth, They've they're, they're figuring it out. They're feeding themselves. And this is what I keep coming back to, the notion of how, how are we going to solve this problem? How are these people going to feed themselves on Mars? Okay, so this is where I'm going to turn it back to Keith, and we're going to talk about the challenges and the solutions and the feasibility of this sort of thing. So, Keith, challenges. What are the challenges, challenges to feeding? And, and how many people are we talking about? How many people do we need for, like, a kind of self-sustaining colony on Mars? Okay, yeah, the uh, the number that gets thrown around is you know minimum of 110 people, as as being something that would allow people to uh, get the work done during the day, have a little bit of leisure time, so they aren't totally burnt out. Uh, 
and to be able to procreate and make some babies. <laughs> make some babies. Uh, so if, if we take that as a starting point, uh, th there's some huge challenges. Number one, you know, it is the atmosphere. The atmosphere on Mars, uh, it's about equivalent to, in terms of pressure, to the Earth's atmosphere 35 kilometers up. Yeah, less than 1% of, of, you know, air pressure at uh, that sea level on Earth. So uh, pretty thin. Uh, yeah, lots of CO2, you know, looks like wonderful stuff. You know, plants use CO2 to photosynthesize. Uh, almost no oxygen. Plants need oxygen as well as CO2. They respire uh you know, the photosynthesis is, is a cycle. So they're they're converting some of the CO2 to oxygen. They're also consuming oxygen to support their metabolisms so they can grow. So so a 95% 90, CO2 atmosphere isn't going to cut it. You can't just compress that down and say, oh, yeah, the plants will be happy. They got lots of CO2. We're going to have to balance uh, what's in the atmosphere. Um Actually, what, that level what, of what percent of our atmosphere is CO two? Uh, yes, we're we're talking parts per million. You know, like 400, less, 400 less, parts. Yeah, we're up to four hundred parts per million. Less than one percent. Less right? than one percent. So, like <laughs> yeah, and twenty one percent oxygen. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a very very different uh, situation than than we've got on Earth. Um. It's also cold. You know, it's uh, it's how like, cold is it? <laughs> uh, Antarctic winter. And, uh, you mean everywhere? Like let's 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 focus on like the equator or something like that. Yeah, yeah. The equator which is should Antarctic. be nice. <laughs> yeah, which should be nice. The equator is Antarctic winter, right? You know, the okay. poles, the uh, you know, the ice caps at the poles. Yes, there's some water ice. There's also some uh, CO two that precipitates out so it's antarctic winter at the uh, the equator it's uh dry ice temperatures at the poles <laughs> yeah okay yeah. okay so yeah. it's really yeah. cold and what's, really what's cold. the warmest it gets at the equator uh, i'm trying to like our best case scenario yeah yeah uh you know there are you know direct you know sun beaming straight down uh calm conditions which are uncommon on mars uh, you know, it might get up to 20, 10 to 20 degrees Celsius. It will get above freezing, but uh, it's not swimsuit weather. And will it stay that, like, is it like that all night? Oh, no. That, no. Oh, no. No, no. But that's let's say the, we have the our, our best day where it's like a nice 20 C, a nice warm, you know, to a Canadian, that's a nice day. Nice 20 C day. And, uh, okay, so I bring my sleeping bag and I, uh, you know, am I going to get cold? How cold am I going to get that night? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the thing with a thin atmosphere. Yes. It's as soon as the uh, the sun goes down, it cools right down. So you'll go from plus 20 in the day to minus 40 at night. That's pretty cold. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Your, your strawberry blossoms are going to freeze. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's the first thing is, is uh, yeah, the atmosphere, temperature, uh, very little water. And plants need water. Uh, yes, I, I was reading a paper about you know precipitable uh, water vapor in the atmosphere being in the the microns. You know, not not millimeters, not inches. You know, if it all rained at once, we get microns of rain, so thousands right. of a millimeter. Right. So so it's it's not something we're going to have precipitation. So they, they consider the finest of finest mists ever and then and then make that mist finer. Yes. That's uh, what you're trying to say. That's yeah, that's the yeah. annual rainfall. If the finer than the finest mist, mist you can conceive of. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, and it's you know, with it that dry, it's also very dusty. There's lots, you know, one of the constituents in the atmosphere, quite variable, but it's you know, been an issue for all of the rovers that have been there is the amount of dust. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, solar panels stop working for after a while because they get covered over with dust. And, it, you know, if they get lucky, they get a windstorm that cleans them off and they work again. Uh, but 
while there's a coating of dust, they are, are not very effective. I was reading um, that they have dust, <laughs> frequent dust storms and sometimes planet wide dust storm. Planet wide. Yeah. I can't yep. even imagine that. Planet wide <laughs> dust. That's a serious dust storm. Mm -hmm. you know? But mm -hmm. you could also, it also makes sense with the lower uh, gravity, right? Yep. You haven't even talked about that, but I mean, it's, there's, the dust doesn't weigh as much. Yeah. I don't know. We won't, we won't get ahead of things. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let yeah. you continue. <laughs> um, next thing is, is radiation. Yes, it's uh, relatively close to the sun, uh, but it's much less radiation than we have here on Earth in terms of visible light or in terms of you know watts of, of solar energy per square meter, or however you want to measure it. Right. Uh, you know, less than half of the uh, intensity of sunlight on Mars that we have on Earth. Um, so just so people, I mean, you're saying the word radiation, everybody's thinking like nuclear reactor, um, but you I'm mean talking, like I'm talking less sunlight. heat, heat sun, like sun. Heat, heat sunlight. You know, all the different wavelengths. The, visi the visible wavelengths that chlorophyll needs. Sun energy in yes. visible, yes, in wavelength yeah. of light, yes. Yeah. So it's less. So it's much less. <laughs> right. Visible light is less, but there's no ozone layer. So ultraviolet is a more. Right. Yeah. So it's one of those situations where, yeah, it wouldn't feel warm, but you could get a heck of a sunburn on Mars if you're not careful. If you're, you're out with, if you're ever out with exposed skin, which well, is can you can, can you explain like to viewers that don't understand these things? Um, let's say there was no ozone layer on Earth and we were just getting bombarded with UV radiation all the time. Mm -hmm. How would how would life on Earth change? Um. What UV radiation does is it will actually uh, break down some of the chemical bonds within cells. You know, that's really what's happening when you get a, a sunburn. You know, it's damage to the cells in our skin. Uh, plants tend to be more, uh, if you like, tolerant of, of UV radiation than we are, but there's a limit to that. And eventually, you know, it will start to break down the cells and plants as well. Right. So, so is photosynthesis it's a, it's, possible with UV or does UV just destroy? Like they say, sunlight is the greatest disinfectant, but is UV an even greater disinfectant? In UV in would be... It, it would disinfect the world. It would disinfect the world. <laughs> okay. yeah. in, a, in, a, in not a good way. Not in a good way. Yeah. Wouldn't, like, yeah. wouldn't look like Mr. Clean was here. It would look it's... like uh, something very biblical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you think of... You know, we sometimes see sun scald on, on plants here on Earth. You know, if, they, if they've had tender growth and then suddenly you get some hot, sunny days, you know, those leaves will, leaves will bleach. Think of the entire plant suffering from that. Or like uh, if you put out your um, unhardened transplant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's just torched. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yes. mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the other thing is there's no magnetic field. So there's more cosmic radiation, more cosmic rays. Uh, the high intensity radiation, so uh, gamma radiation, uh, the beta particles, again, uh, quite hard on on living tissue. Right. So there'd have to be some level of protection, you know, for the plants, uh, just to to protect them from that. So so there's challenges there with not enough light, but too much of the other wavelengths. Uh, Talked about water, you know, you'd have to find a source or create a source of water somehow. Uh, mineralogy, I was looking a little bit at, at the mineralogy. Uh, you know, there are clay minerals, uh, there are carbonates. There has been water in the past. So, you know, there's, there's probably enough calcium, magnesium, iron, most of the micronutrients. Uh, one thing that's Two things that will be in short supply. One is nitrogen. There's very little nitrogen in the atmosphere. So pulling in out of the atmosphere the way we do on Earth is, is a non-starter. It's something will have to be imported. Well, you couldn't just like grow beans and legumes and, and, and you know, ha just help. They just pull it out and fix it in their nodules. There's nothing to pull uh, out. There's nothing to pull out. Nothing to pull out. You know, we're, we're, you know. Our atmosphere on Earth is seventy-eight percent nitrogen, and that you know that nitrogen it's in a form that's not 
uh, it's not available to plants. Even, yeah, even then, it, it's practically useless. It's, it's practically it's practically useless, but a it's few crops. <laughs> but it, you know, it is there that legumes can pull that out. Yes, convert it into a, an available form. You know, industrial fixation, we can can crack those uh, N two bonds and convert it into ammonia. Uh, yeah, the atmosphere on Mars is about 3% nitrogen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, less than ideal. Less, yeah, yeah, a 20th of the concentration. So even if you grow a, you know, gangbuster legume crop, there's not enough N there to be able to to pull that out. Uh, the other thing was... that didn't, didn't show up in the mineralogy report at all was phosphorus. Phosphorus. So you'd have to bring that. Yes. Would that be in like a... You know, poop and pee. Like, would phosphorus be? I mean, we got people there. They they're kind of using well, once, the bathroom. Yeah, once, yes. Once once they're there, once things are cycling, we can recycle that. Right. But you need something to start the cycle. Oh, oh. So like, <laughs> yeah. okay. So like, yeah. If you had a hundred and hundred and ten people there, the only phosphorus would be the phosphorus in their poop and pee. And so yeah. they'd have to have like a high phosphorus diet <laughs> or something, or maybe saving all of that waste, the whole voyage. It was, how long does it take to get to Mars? Like nine months or something like that? Is well, that... it depends on which which orbit you use and you know, uh, and how much fuel you want to burn. The quicker you go, the, the you know, more fuel it's going to take to get there. Um, something I was wondering about was um, like uh, when we're growing stuff here on Earth, I mean, you can just use inputs like in a uh, uh, aquaponic type situation where you're you're adding inputs, or even mm -hmm. some some. Let's say we have a garden where the the soil is just completely dead, so we have to add stuff. But right. generally speaking, we rely on a soil food web type situation where there's all these organisms in the soil, and there's organic material breaking down, and there's soil organisms in the soil doing all this work. Um, there's, I assume there's no soil organisms in Mars, so we would have to bring those somehow or like there's, there's no, yeah. the, the existing, aside from the soil having not a lot of stuff in it compared to earth soil, uh, kind of just being like rocks and dust and clay and some, st and some minerals, but there's also like not, it's not teeming with this life, um, you know, waiting to proliferate and that sort of thing. Yeah. How yeah. It would problem be, is that? it would be wrong to call it a soil a Martian soil because it is at the moment dead. Right. You know, uh, and part of what makes soil soil is, is the life within the soil. Um, yes. It's, it's a, it's an area that needs a lot of research uh, and it's a challenge. And it's also an opportunity. Um, you know, could we create, if you like, a microbial soup that we would add to the soil to, to kickstart, you know, the cycling that has all the beneficial organisms we need without any of the pathogens. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, uh, it's going to be a contained, whatever we do, it's going to be a contained system. If we can keep all the pathogens out, you know, from the get go, that's, that's one that we don't have to deal with. It's kind of like, some of the greenhouse production here on earth where they just they keep they don't need to use pesticides they keep the pests out yes yes uh, exactly <laughs> the pesticide is the planet <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> there's another thing i was thinking about was we've got this group of people living on mars we have to feed everybody and have, everybody has to be healthy and so everything you and i've been talking about thus far has been this is a vegan colony right? Because we're just talking yep. about growing things. But as far as I understand it, human beings need, um, we can get protein from vegetables, but B12 is another, I'm not, I'm not sure to what extent you can just grow some goop in a vat and get your B12 out of that. Um, you know, I was talking to people, I've been talking to people at work about mm -hmm. this on coffee. Mm -hmm. So why don't you just bring chickens? It's like, you got to keep chickens alive in a spaceship for nine months. Can you imagine, you know, like, so I was thinking maybe like worms, you know, you have a whole bunch of worms and then we can eat, make some sort of like 
paste and mm-hmm. worms. And <laughs> I'm not, I think I'm not really looking too favorably on this Martian diet, but, but anyway, <laughs> cause I like eggs. I like, <laughs> there's a few things I really like, <laughs> but let's say we've got, you know, soybeans and stuff like that, but yeah, how are we going to solve our B12 problem? And no, do we have a B12 problem? Well, we, we probably do, you know, right. with a, a strictly vegetarian diet. Uh, yeah, protein, some of the vitamins, some of the minerals, are, they're going to be hard to maintain adequate supply. Uh, and that may be, you know, where a cultured meat of some sort becomes. Or even hard. like, like, as far as I understand it, you can you can get everything you need from a vegan diet but you have to grow the variety of things that makes that possible, which means that the thing, like I live here in Nova Scotia, Canada, near the coast, and you live in Guelph, Ontario. Yep. There's things you can grow better there than I can grow here. Right. Right. If you were trying to like grow a farm and feed people, and I was trying to grow a farm and feed people, there's crops you could grow successfully at a quantity with a yield. That would be foolish for me to try to grow like watermelon. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you're going to do better with watermelons than I am here um, because it's colder and foggier and not as right. you know, as nice a summer as you. So even if let's run with the assumption that person can get everything they need from a vegan diet, except B12, let's just say, mm-hmm. but this runs on the assumption that there's this variety of, of produce that can be grown successfully at quantity, at yield. Consistently. Consistently <laughs> on a planet that is- it's trying to minus, trying to kill you. <laughs> minus 40 at night and so on, right? Like it's, yeah, it's yeah. I was thinking, the way I was thinking, imagine if you had a desert in like the Yukon or, you know, the coldest part of Alaska or Nunavut or something like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, would that be a great place to set up? Would you want to set up your agricultural operation there, right? Just sort of less than ideal. Uh, okay, so these are all our problems. We're too cold, too dry. Um, you've deadly rays, yeah. <laughs> deadly cosmic rays, and a great variety of them. Um, what were the other stuff? Uh, yeah, not not enough light. Not enough light. Yeah, like a different kind of light, less yep. sort of less available. That's which is a bit. People don't understand how much of a difference. You know, I have a coworker, and she was trying to like could not understand why your garden didn't do that really well this year. And then after talking for like half an hour, she said, well, it's under this big maple tree. And I was <laughs> like, well, you're only getting half the light. You know, you're getting dappled light, you know, like it's less. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't have light. There's not a lot going to happen because that's the mm-hmm, whole machine. Mm-hmm. That's the whole engine. That's that's what drives it. Yes. Okay. So we've got, we got a, a list of problems now, but we're clever science people. And uh, you're so, you know, we've hired you. We're giving you, Elon Musk giving you $10 million to figure this out. Um, you know, your 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 family is going to be rich forever till the end of time if you can just figure this out, Keith. Yeah, sorry, so, ten million, ten million won't even start to uh, 10, ten billion. Get, get, yeah, ten just billion not, might we might yeah, make a start at it. Yeah. Ten billion, Keith. Come on, get to work. <laughs> okay, so so how <laughs> how are we going to solve all these problems? Okay, we, how how is there a solution to all of these? Is problems? there is there a solution? Well, uh, and conceivable, imagination, anything's possible. Engineers are, are smart people. They can do yes. they can do a lot of stuff. So we're looking at an enclosed structure of some sort, a contained structure. Uh, you know, one option is okay. We we do a uh, have a dome. Maybe it's supported by pressure inside, so it's. Uh, it has to be tough enough to uh, withstand the winds, but. It doesn't have to be a heavy structure because it's uh, the atmosphere or the pressure inside will do the supporting. Oh, so you're saying a, like a pressure dome as opposed like to a, a pressure geodesic, dome. instead of a geodesic dome. Yeah. yeah. Right? So for people that don't know, like if you've ever gone into a pressure dome, it's one of these dome structures. There's usually some sort of uh, one of those turning doors. And when you go in, your ears pop immediately. Um, we have one here in Nova Scotia. Uh, a, a sports facility that is one of those. You go in mm-hmm. and immediately you have to equalize because um, it's a pressure dome. Um, that's a very that would that would be less weight. You know, 
it's you know it, okay. yeah so it's yeah, it's it's enough. going to be it, and the question is going to be it it will be less weight it's probably more transmissible for visible light uh might be too transmissible for cosmic rays or uh, uh uv and is going to be subject to the vagaries of the weather this is okay so, so this is the challenge like whatever the dome is made of and you haven't even talked about the size yet mm -hmm. but this dome has to be it has to block the uv it has to block the cosmic rays and it has to somehow be relatively unaffected by all this dust and sand mm -hmm. uh, sandstorm they're du are they dust storm let's just say they're dust storms dust yeah it'd be dust storms so it has to be of a material that would not be scored and made opaque uh, you yep. know, maybe opaque would be good but it can't be worn down and kill everybody too mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and it has to be either of a design or of a mechanism such that we can get this stuff off I mean, we're not going to go out there, assuming this thing's big, and I'm going to guess it's going to be big, um, and sweep this thing. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, you know, we had a stormy night, and the whole thing's covered in dust, and now we're getting like 30% light. We got to, you know, we can't just wait for this thing to correct itself because it's minus 40 or worse, and we need that light. Need that light. Uh I'm thinking if this material is tough enough and it's flexible, uh, that's where you'd use sound waves to clean it off. Sound waves. Oh, like some sort of. Just, just sort of bump bong. and bong and shake the uh, dust off. That's very clever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's, let's say that's, okay. We've saw it's solvable. The dust that, is that, solvable. That piece, that's solvable. And, and it's, yeah, the materials that this dome would be made of, we don't have yet. Okay. Like, I think that's, you know, it's it's something, at least I don't think we do. I think the tensile strength of that is going to be high enough that, that uh, it's not something that we have currently. For, um, for, a, for a compression dome, it has to be something with elasticity that is extremely tough. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and ideally could be manufactured from materials on Mars. Right. <laughs> so we don't have to carry the darn thing. Yeah. Uh, yep. So it's, you know, and that's, you know, that's saying, okay, that's, that's one way to say we'll do stuff in a dome where we're depending on incident light. Uh, you know, we talked about, you know, we haven't got to, you know, how big does it need to be? Let's do that. Yeah, how yeah. Big so, so it, yeah. To feed uh, those. Okay, how much space do you need to feed uh, one person? And let's sort of extrapolate out to 110 people. Yeah. So, guideline is sort of 10 people per hectare, or 100 uh, 100 square meters per person. Okay, that's a lot of. That's big. That's big. <laughs> that's um, like in, in terms of football fields. That's. Like two football fields? Is that, or not two? Yeah. One yeah, and a half sorry. football field. Sorry, 10 people per hectare would be 1,000 square meters per person. Yeah. So you're talking big, big. Uh, uh, that's 10 people per hectare is four people per acre. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's. So if we're going to have everything under domes uh that would be 10 domes with 120 meter diameter each 10 domes with 120 meter diameter each yep and one dome like it maybe that wouldn't even so be... so 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 uh 10 i guess it's the rogers center now 10 sky domes Ten sky domes, yes, mm -hmm. and that would be preferable to one dome because there's some sort of limitation of physics, like it would be too heavy. There would be too much weight over that amount of space. Uh, the, the risk of it, maybe the, the risk, the, uh, the yeah, risk. some some of it is risk mitigation. Right, you yep. have like one of them go down, you still got the other nine, um, opposed to like one hole 
one, they, <laughs> one, one tiny hole and we're all dead. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, the other thing is, as you get bigger, the strength of the material needs to get greater. Right. Um, so that, to me, is a, it's a significant engineering challenge. Uh, I suspect if this is going to work, it will be a different way of doing things. There may be some domes that are using incident light and fairly extensive areas. I suspect the bulk of the food would be actually uh, in caves or in caverns. Like mushroom below... stuff or with no, nope. no, no. Synthetic or uh, artificial light. We're, we're, we're below the surface, so we're protected from the temperature extremes, we're protected from the radiation. Right. Uh, we've got a crap load of solar panels and LED lights lighting multiple layers of crops within uh, a much smaller footprint. I see you're talking, okay, so you're talking about a vertical underground garden with artificial yep. light. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Yep. Um, and a chunk of that's going to be devoted to things like algae, where you can right. get much, you know, very high output for a you know, relatively small right. area. Algae and fungus and bacteria and various yep. kinds of like... Goop. <laughs> goop, goop, goop. Yeast. Um, <laughs> I remember yeah. reading an Isaac Asimov novel, and there, there was a planet they go to, and all the food is made from yeast. Various, they have different kinds of yeast, and they use the yeast to approximate, like they have a cheese that's made from yeast, and they have a kind of bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> various, you know, they, they've, they've got a very sophisticated process of uh, turning yeast into things, <laughs> going different kinds of yeast. Uh, but it's all because it's kind of solving a similar problem where they have to sort of mm -hmm. do it underground to hide, you know, to get to solve the heat problem and solve other problems. Um, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's probably goop rather than the regular crop. It, you know, the vegetables, the grains uh, will be part of it, but would be a fairly small part of the diet. Uh, right. frankly, it's not something I'd want to live on, but it <laughs> would keep you alive. Well, yes, yes, yes. Right. You know, and that hundred square or thousand square meters per person, that's, that's assuming everything goes right. Right. So it'd have to be larger to assume for failures and. Uh, yep. Yeah. Right. And uh, to, I mean, also we need a place to live. Um. Yeah, this is this is just the area to grow stuff. This is not living space. Um, you know, this is this is the area needed to supply the food for the colony, not everything else the colony needs for for living space and recreation sure. space. And you know, so and in a place like Mars, we have to bring a good deal of everything. That's it's yeah. not like we can go there and chop down trees and make uh, cabins out of the trees, right? It's everything has to be. I mean, I mean, they've got, there's rocks and clay, um, but even then we'd have to bring like bags of Portland cement or something. <laughs> you know, maybe we, I suppose we could make cement there if they have enough, uh, you know, limestone or whatever, but where, where is that stuff? Do we know where it is? And not only that, it's not, uh, you know, just, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an industrial process turning the, the raw materials that become cement into cement you don't just dig yep. it out of the ground and it's cement you got to heat it up and you got to have all this fuel and heat and energy and various forms of chemicals and stuff like that so yes but, uh, i suspect it will be a, an exercise in creating novel building materials yes <laughs> yes you know, you know yes. uh deciding you know what's there what can we use how can we use it to to do as much as possible with what's on mars to minimize what we have to take. Um, you know, water is heavy. I'm thinking, you know, that's that's going to be an issue unless we can find below, you know, water below the surface, water deposits somewhere that are extractable. 
it means taking you know just the water to feed the, those crops or supply those crops, which is is huge. Once it's there, you know, it can be recycled. But yes. Yes. You, you, the initial the uh, the initial part, no, you have to take that water with you. Uh, That's right. And it, 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 occurred, it occurred to me that probably the most efficient way to do that is to take it as hydrogen and oxygen and fuel cells. Right. So it's all compressed. You're you're taking the gases in a compressed form. You're using the fuel cells to uh, give you the energy to get you know create electricity to get you started and what comes out of a fuel cell is water your pollution is water and... your pollution is water right right yes so yes. so you you take it in a form that you actually use to extract energy and get the water as a byproduct you solve two problems yeah yes you solve your energy problem and solve your water problem and then there's the question of how again how much does that all weigh uh, mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. other, yeah, the other solution is there's water on Mars and you can use it. But is the water, you know, like I assume if you're going to be doing something agricultural, um, I mean, either you're growing stuff from the sun and that's everything, or you're growing stuff underground and it's all like mushrooms and stuff like that, and you're just getting solar. Well, it's but, it's it's yeah, it wouldn't be mushrooms and stuff. It would be we would actually be growing crops. Um, I guess an example of the system uh, is where they're doing sort of the container unit greenhouses, right? Uh, that are that are being used in Northwest Territories, Nunavut. I see. Uh, where it's LED lights, and they're probably using a diesel generator to generate the electricity, mm -hmm. but the LED lights are tuned that they're putting out the wavelength that chlorophyll needs. Right. So they're very efficient. You know, you're getting the maximum return from the the energy you're putting into the light, so they can grow high yields in a small space. Right. Now, within a container, just you open the door and it's it's bright inside, but it's protected from the elements. So that's that's more the situ situation I would see as being the biggest part of the food supply. Oh, I see. So yeah, and not not. Fields you're, you're, of wheat, wheat growing underneath a dome on the Martians, under the Martian sun, um, you know, that's or corn or beans or potatoes mm -hmm. or something like that. It's more like we've got, we're growing in the sun, the things we have to grow in the sun, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and everything else, we're capturing solar energy with solar panels, making electricity, which runs LED lights, which grows stuff underground. Yep. Yeah. Right. Okay. This sort of, it could be, I suppose, hydroponic type situation mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that might solve some other problems. Um, okay, so in principle, we have we have a solution to all of our problems, <laughs> I guess. But now, I mean, is this is there any more solutions, or is this sort of the have we hashed? Yeah, I think we're, we've decided. You know, we're going to have to bring our nitrogen fertilizer. We're going to have to bring our uh, phosphorus fertilizer. The rest we can probably get from the uh, the minerals on Mars. Right. We got to bring uh, solar panels. We got to bring all these yep. materials for enclosing ourselves and protecting mm -hmm, ourselves mm -hmm. and blocking out UV and all that sort of stuff. Okay. So let's talk about. So we got to get the stuff free of Earth's gravity, and we got to get it to Mars. I mean, how much stuff are we talking about? Right. I mean. Like, Think of the the cost and energy and resources it took to put the Mars rover, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like a, I don't know how big that thing was. Let's say it's the size of an e-bike or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. This is uh, we we're talking like either uh, an incredible amount of some sort of space age mylar that's better than mylar, that's transparent, that's super awesome, mm -hmm. or or something like glass like. Or some sort of industrial operation that can turn Martian sand or Martian materials into, right? Like if we're going to yeah, make stuff yeah. on Mars, we have to bring the means to make stuff on yeah, Mars, yeah, right? Yeah. And we don't have Star Trek's 
replicators that just make things <laughs> be oh great we're oh. we're we're a long way from that oh, yeah yeah yes. so yeah what's the feasibility here it's yeah it's going to be incredibly expensive you know first deciding you know what has to come from earth what could come from the moon or from you know mining asteroids or from the you know martian surface itself uh a lot of the stuff, uh, once we get it out of Earth's gravity well, which is really that that's 90% of getting to Mars is getting off, off of Earth. Off of Earth, <laughs> yes. Um, stuff you can put in a, you know, the slow boat to Mars, you know, a long orbit that it doesn't take very much uh energy to get the spaceship uh, started on the uh, the orbital path but it might take four or five years to get there because it'll loop around several times mm -hmm. you know to get things in the right place uh the colonists themselves aren't going to want to wait that long so it's it's sort of separate operations it's getting the people there on a nine month trip getting the stuff there you know it would have to be launched five years before the people take off right uh, you know uh, and nothing it, can go wrong and nothing can go wrong yes uh, yeah is it feasible well we're pretty ingenious we can do anything we we put our mind to but is it practical uh, I'd say it's a long shot I started to think like how many people have to starve so this can happen like how many hospitals aren't <laughs> built you know what I mean like it's like how mm -hmm, much mm -hmm. how much money and re how much how much carbon are we going to dump into our own atmosphere to get this stuff away from our gravity yeah like unless we come up with some new I mean mm -hmm. let's say we have some other way to get around like in Star Trek right but we don't like all we do is blow stuff up and get in front of it <laughs> And go that way, you know, make an explosion mm -hmm. and go that mm -hmm. way. That's how we get away from Earth. Um, you know, we've got theoretical ways once we're away from Earth to to go around, like solar sails or this sort of stuff, which in mm -hmm. principle can work. But getting off of Earth into the orbit, we blow up stuff. Uh, you know, I don't. I mean, yeah, yeah. We we need Arthur C. Clarke's uh, space elevator. Yeah, a space elevator, you know, or something, something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it made a good point. If there's a lot of stuff on the moon or some other atmosphere in between Earth and Mars, I don't know what really there is other than the moon. Um, I don't think there is there is a lot on the moon. Um, and of course, all of your mining on the moon is different than mining on Earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, you're, uh, you know, you can almost get any poor unfortunate person on earth and send them under the ground with a hammer and start mining uh, on the moon. You need like incredibly sophisticated people and sophisticated equipment. And the cost is mm -hmm, extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, I just, I try to think about how much stuff needs to go, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and how, yeah, it's, it's a huge undertaking. The weight. The way to get this a, stuff to get 110 people there, just to get the people there alive. Well, just well, just to say, okay, that's that's our minimum viable colony. Um, and these aren't just any people; these yeah. are extraordinary people, right? These aren't you don't just grab 110 people like the example I gave with the teenagers. Mm -hmm. You, know, you mm -hmm. drop them off in Tahiti. There's coconuts, there's bananas. They could just you know lay around, have you know, you know, just procreate and have a great time. Like I just watched. Uh, Mutant in the Bounty with my son. <laughs> he's 14. He's kind of like, wow, that looks great. <laughs> <You know? laughs> when they go to Tahiti. Um, but yeah, this is... Yeah, this, but they, the other the other possibilities, it could more look, look more, more like Lord of the Flies. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, these aren't just any ordinary kinds of people. Um, but yeah, that's where, where I get hung up is how are you going to get all this stuff over there. And mm -hmm. even if you're going to make stuff when you get there, you got to bring the thing you're using to make the stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like let's say, let's say 
that through some sort of spectral analysis, they identify that they have all the materials they need to make cement or something like cement. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and they're going to bring a cement factory with them. <laughs> you know? Yeah, the engineering calculation <laughs> becomes, is it, uh, is it better to send the machinery to build stuff there or just to send the stuff? Well, when you think about when they, yes. you know, when when the new world was colonized, I mean, what do you need to bring an axe, a saw, people with brains, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of really tough people to do the hard work, you know, backs, you know, strong backs. Um, and you can do anything, <laughs> you know. And, and uh, a fair bit of attrition in the population. And attrition. Yes. They didn't all survive. No, there's attrition. That's true. And, I mean, if you think about it, if you've got some sort of enclosed population, it's if something goes wrong, mm -hmm. it could go really wrong. <laughs> yep. You know, like it have the other thing I was thinking about too. I was just thinking about this last night. So, if you've got people going to Mars, and so they're going to live in with a, in a controlled environment for an extended period of time with controlled air, right? Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of, you know, like you and I right now are breathing dust, we're breathing particulate, we're breathing fungus, we're breathing bacteria. I mean, the stuff going in and out of us is incredible. Yeah. And we're, we're fine. Um, but... Let's say, uh, let's say I go to Mars tomorrow, and uh, my great 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 grandson is on Mars uh, with thirty eight percent gravity, and the Mars air, which is let's say it's this pristine perfect air with filters and HEPA mm -hmm, filters. Mm -hmm. and all. We this this person cannot come back to Earth. I mean the gravity and the just the the utter filth and the in, yeah, in the yeah, air there. Yeah. You know, like these people are not coming back. That they will they will lose back. they will lose they will lose their immune systems. Absolutely. And their their bodies would just mm -hmm. they'd be like a big head with this tiny body. They would literally look like space aliens. The head the head would have to survive because the brain's very important, but mm -hmm. they don't need all this caveman power that we have, um, you know, to withstand uh one G. Mm -hmm. Right, because mm -hmm. they're a fraction of G, right? So they're going to be. And then there's the question of like, what happens when we send people to outer space? Chris Hatfield or whoever, they're lifting weights and they're doing stuff like that, but it's it's temporary. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, a long time on a place like Mars. It, 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 I was thinking well, about the human physiology and the plant physiology. I mean. Matt Damon grew potatoes on Mars in a movie, mm -hmm. right? Just like Rocky Balboa beat Carl Weathers in a movie, but in real life, I don't think Rock. I don't think Sylvester <laughs> Stallone would. You know, I don't think Sylvester Stallone is going to beat Carl Weathers in a real. You know, yeah. Matt yeah. Damon grew potatoes on Mars in a movie. But you think about how would plants? I mean, everything on Earth is evolved for our gravitational field for how yep, our planet yep. works how are things going to how is it going to affect us how is our blood going to work like just over time over time and yeah i suspect well i think what we've learned from the people who have spent a long time you know long periods of time relative relatively long so 300 days 330 days you know in zero gravity and we can measure what the changes are. The changes uh, for the people who go to Mars will, I suspect, be fairly minor because they're, they'll, they'll have more impact from the zero G on the way there than they have actually living on Mars. Right. It's the next generation. What happens to a baby that is born into Martian gravity. An embryo. And yeah. 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 The well, baby. and then, you know, really the embryo is in a, what's probably pretty close to a zero G environment floating in the amniotic. It's, it's, fluid. Well, it's, 
<laughs> yeah, it's after they're sensory born. Deprivation tank or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's after they're born. Right. That. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and that's that becomes a genetic experiment. Yes. Yeah. You know, yes. I don't. I. I'm not sure we can predict what's going to happen. No. Yeah. Exactly. Um. So I read somewhere that I think Elon Musk is talking about having a manned trip to Mars in 2028. Um, this seems uh, optimistic, um, but that's not a colony. That's just like, we're going to send some humans there and they're going to come back. We're going to get a lot of press. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would assume that's what, what they're talking about. Um, but I wonder how far, like, I'm not, I don't think we have a solution to getting this stuff off and over right now, considering yeah, the yeah. scale, the size of these domes you're talking about, right? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, like we, we need domes bigger than any domes that exist on earth or, or, or we need one dome that's, I don't know, 10 times the size of the biggest dome ever, you know, or something mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. talking geodesic, or we need multiple domes that are as big as anything we've got. And these things have to fly <laughs> yeah, yeah. to get there. Right. Or we need to bring all this stuff to make, and we got to bring all this other stuff, mm -hmm, right. And mm -hmm. the people and keep them alive. Right. Um, so I'm not, you know, yeah. the idea of this with current technology just seems to be completely, um, a fantasy um for me anyway i don't know how, how do you feel about it I, I would put it in the same category and i think the value in thinking about it is sort of to illustrate uh the scale of the challenge you know if we decided we wanted to do this and how impractical it is uh, and it comes back to there is no planet b yeah yeah you know, uh, pinning our hopes on a colony on Mars, uh, you know, becoming the, the reservoir that's going to save humanity from Plan screw B. up this planet is is uh, is fantasy. It's like, I got a plan B. Let's go to the worst place ever mm -hmm. and try to live there, you know, because really, mm -hmm. if you think about Mars, it would be the worst place ever. Like, you know, the, the worst places here are better than there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there is there a place on Earth that's worse? Is is the best place on Mars better than the worst place on Earth? <laughs> no, I mean I I can't I can't say yes to that question because at least you've got an atmosphere, yep. you know, like yep. you're, uh, you know, you're the worst place on Earth has at least a better summer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, our winter. I mean, our winter, the worst winters are like your equatorial summer night yep. in Mars. Yep. <laughs> our worst, you know, like, so it's, uh, I, I just wonder, why do you think there's so much, I mean, when you think about the scale of the problems we have right now on Earth with, you know, this, uh, an incredible climate change situation, sea levels rising, polar ice caps melting, uh, fires and it's even affected us here in nova scotia mm -hmm. rains i mean this this was the year we had it all <laughs> right we had a pestilence you know we, we had a, we had a disease we had a flood and we had a fire here right in nova little old nova scotia right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i mean to me the scale of the problems we have here why are people looking for water on the moon and talking about going to mars when it seems to me like uh, all of our best minds should be focused on trying to solve the problems we have on, on the, the better place to live. Why do you think there's so much energy and imagination being put into this pr proposition? And I think some of it comes back to our, you know, human drive to explore. Yes. To, to go new places. Um, And it's, I think it's a very different proposition to think about, okay, a, a permanent self-sustaining colony as opposed to 
an outpost where we do research and we we find out what's there and find out how uh, how other places work because we'll understand better what's happening here if we understand other places right um and you know what's going on now you know looking for water on the moon looking for water on the you know on mars uh is necessary for feel like a temporary research station as much as it is for a you know a permanent colony yes so uh there there's that part of it that uh we will develop technologies to doing this that will be applicable on earth right you know think of you know the things that have come out of the the apollo program and the lead up to it that has become part of our daily lives now right which uh we're not you know the things we've we've taken and and made commonplace you know we're perhaps not the things that uh you might have anticipated from getting to the moon right but they're they're that it's that uh uh peripheral stuff that ends up changing our lives that's the question of the net gain. Like, I wonder, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to put a research station on Mars and have a, a you know, a staff there with 10 people. And, mm -hmm. you know, like this is not self-sustaining. We're, we're, we're using resources to keep that yeah, going yeah. so we can take readings and we can, you know, we can, we can do, maybe we can do a kind of star charting that we can't do mm -hmm, on earth mm -hmm. because it, all that sort of stuff. But then the question, like how much, because, at the end of the day, we're, we're running in a zero sum game. So all of the resources we're putting into that mean we can't. So I think about it like this, a country like the United <laughs> States, which doesn't have a, a, a healthcare system, mm -hmm. right? And there's a cost. The big argument is, well, how much is that going to cost, right? So imagine if the proposition was, okay, you can have the greatest healthcare system in the history of humanity better than any country in the world. Or we can send 10 scientists to Mars to take really cool readings of the sand on <laughs> Mars and some other stuff. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, or we can, so, we can feed all the hungry people in the world. Or we can send 10 scientists to Mars to, to, to look at Uranus. Uh, <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for lack of a, a funnier planet. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, like this to me, like I just, if 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 we have infinite resources and and no problems, then I'm like, yeah, let's go. I, I want to do all. I, I watched Star Trek growing up. I, I want to do all the. I want to do all the awesome stuff, and I'm, I'm not interested in the boring stuff, mm -hmm. right? But when we've got so many problems on a global scale, right? Um, you have if we're doing something like that, and the cost is not minimal. The cost is probably mm -hmm. quite extraordinary mm -hmm. or like, here's another one we could do that send 10 guys to mars so they can take readings or we can remove enough of the carbon from the atmosphere to to halt global warming where it is you know if we've got a new technology it'll just suck it all out mm -hmm. stick it in the mm -hmm. ground somehow right <laughs> we, we can do this it's going to cost a trillion zillion zillion dollars which is which happens to be what it would cost to have 10 people live on Mars for five years because uh, it would not be cheap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, is this, the, the only reason you'd send 10 people to Mars instead of doing that is because if you could learn something on Mars that makes solving this other problem even easier, uh, I can't see you figuring that mm -hmm, out on Mars mm -hmm. because there's no bloody atmosphere there. There's, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's an atmosphere, but it's practically not, and it's not the kind of atmosphere we want. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this comes down to the scientist's imagination. Because, right, like you were saying, with uh, space flight, uh, you know, we 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 learned the things we had to figure out to put a man on the moon. You know, had incredible mm -hmm. payoffs mm -hmm. in other areas. Um, but yeah, that's my confusion with this: is why are we so? I have this funny feeling. I'm going to give you my take. Is that? In our collective minds, we're we're all consciously or subconsciously 
playing around, tossing around the notion mm -hmm. of this this game not working, right? This ending. And so, you know, people want to think there's a other thing we can do. Like people want to believe there's an other thing we can do because it's 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 more it's comforting to believe that right mm -hmm, it's comforting mm -hmm. to believe that there's another thing we can do uh as opposed to the really really hard uh unsettling uh problem of grappling with the problems we have and maybe accepting that or, the solutions are not you know like the solutions are not Persisting on Earth might not be what we think it's going to be. Uh, you know, like it's not going to be. Mm -hmm. When I when mm -hmm. I was a kid, we watched the Jetsons, right? Right. And the future was like it was amazing, right? George Jetson would go in the bathroom, fifteen machines would brush his hair and brush his teeth, mm -hmm. he'd, he'd come. You know, in one, one second he was clean, right? And he would just uh, step out of his door, and a spaceship would take him to work, and everything was, you know, just everything was amazing, right? Um, and certainly life is easier for me than it was for my parents and life is easier for them than it was for their parents. Yep, um, yep. But is it the case that it's going to, that's going to be the case 50 years from now or a hundred years from now. And um, it, yeah, there, there's two sides to it. One is, uh, you know, with global warming, because there's a lot of global warming or climate change sort of baked in. Yes. Uh, the world will not end. No. But the world will be different. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I think you talk about, well, people, they, they want to think, oh, there's always an alternative. There's there's something we, we will be able to do. Um, <laughs> the restrictions there would be a whole lot greater than anything we'll have to deal with here you know, in slowing changes that we would need to make to slow down global warming here on as hard, Earth. As hard as life will get here, it's going to be much harder to, to live there. Yes, yes. exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Um, you know, I think some of it is if we did something to suck all the carbon dioxide out and, you know, halt global warming, um, 90% of the population would think it was a bad idea because they don't actually see any difference. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> they, they don't want like, you know, uh, bread to fall from the sky or something. Yes, you know? yeah, like, yeah. That's, well, my life still sucks. I still have a, sh a lousy job and, um, you know, my, you know, I don't have all the stuff I want. Yep, and, yep. Uh, and, it, and it still rains on the weekends. You know, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> this was um, the summer of that too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's, <laughs> Where if we put somebody on Mars, well, see, we did something. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's something. It's something we can see. Uh, yes, that's I true. Think it's, it's that. Oh God, sort of Keith, primal... I hope that's not it. Like you know, I, solving I that... our problem is like zero political cachet, and doing I... a thing that does nothing to solve our problem, you know, it's... is huge cachet. Exactly. <laughs> yes, you could be right. That's. I that's think a... that's oh. that's that's an unfortunate reality that. Uh, we do not always behave rationally. Oh, yeah, that's true. Like we could spend the equivalent of like half the global GDP to keep things exactly as they are right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a very sexy story. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a sexy story if you fully grasp where this can go if we don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you really grasp, it's funny. When I was a kid, um, so I grew up, I was born in 1972, man, we grew up in the shadow of the Cold War, right? I remember I was so worried about a nuclear war that, you know, some mornings there'd be uh, like a, uh, uh, a forest fire somewhere mm -hmm. and the sunrise would look exceptionally red. And on those mornings, I thought the world had blown up. Yeah, because I grew up on a steady diet of these apocalypse movies. Like there was one that was on TV, it was on ABC. I'm sure you saw it. It was called The Day After. Everybody saw it. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody saw it. It was just ordinary people going about their life. 
and all of a sudden there's this flash. Yeah. Right. And their whole society collapses, you know, all kinds of bad things happen. Mm-hmm. Like all the, all mm-hmm. the, all the fertile women have, and there was an even worse one done in England. I can't remember the name of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like the, I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's like, so we, in, in the United States, they did the day after. Apparently, this affected Ronald Reagan. It literally changed his mind about sure. nuclear nuclear proliferation. A Hollywood movie changed Ronald Reagan's mind. Um, but the, there was a movie they did in uh, England, which was way darker and way <laughs> worse. I and mean, if you've ever seen it, I can't remember what it's called. Someone will put it in the comments of this mm-hmm. podcast. Um, but I grew up on these this fear, right? Yeah. Uh, I wonder if... See, it seems like the world's more cynical now because we've had all kinds of movies and documentaries saying, hey, you know, it's not going to be good if things mm-hmm, get warmer. Mm-hmm. And people are like, ah, you know, <laughs> that's other people. I'll live in the good place. You know, well, but... <laughs> that, yeah, those those changes, those changes happen slowly. They do happen very slowly. Yeah. yeah so we don't... a nuclear war is instantaneous. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. That's that's true. It's it's ten years from now, fifty years from now, hundred years from now. Mm-hmm. Um, people have a hard time thinking on that time scale, right? Um, yep, yeah, yeah. And it's easy to believe that it'll happen to somebody else and not to me, or that they're just going to figure something out. Something, something, something's yeah, going to yeah. you know, mm-hmm. They'll figure something out. You know, of course mm-hmm. they're going to be more smart. We'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. You no. Know? Um, or almost like, you know, I'm I'm going to be one of those really rich guys that has a compound with, you know, all kinds of cool stuff, and everybody else will be <laughs> kind of suffering, you know, and I'll be like, you know, I'll be I'll be behind my razor wire and, uh, yeah, that sort of thing. <laughs> the movie to watch when you're thinking about Mars is Soylent Green. Soylent Green. <laughs> 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 that last scene where Charlton Heston is screaming, Soylent Green is people. It's people, it's people. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> because that becomes how you have a sustainable colony on Mars. <laughs> for those that don't know, well, should we, you know, we can't ruin it for them. No. Well, you just told them, Soylent Green well, is people. Yes. Yeah, anyway. I, I don't think that's that's giving any uh, anything away, but... Uh, Worth watching. Yes, yeah, it's definitely a classic movie that and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Planet of the Apes and that sort of thing. And also Soylent Green is kind of a prophetic movie about climate change. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I think they're in Los Angeles in Soylent Green. And I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. And it's not looking so good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the world's not a great place. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I suppose in a place like Mars, nothing would want to go to waste. Everything. That's right. One of the, I mean, there's your B12. Mm-hmm. Grand, granddad. Yeah. <laughs> granddad and grandmother are. Yes, yes. But it's, it's yeah, grand, granddad's feeding the yeast that make the B12. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> do, do you, have you seen the movie uh, Waterworld with uh, Kevin Costner? I've never managed to watch the whole thing. <laughs> there's a scene where a, a lady dies, an old woman dies. And they lower air, like, so the whole world's covered in water, mm-hmm. and people live on these atolls, these sort of like floating cities. Mm-hmm. And the most valuable thing is uh, soil, right? Soil is like money, right? Soil and water. But basically, mm-hmm. if you, people use soil. Like, if I want to buy something from you, uh, when I go to an atoll, I give them some soil, and they'd weigh it, and they give me some chips to use to buy <laughs> water or whatever, right? Um, anyway, there's a scene where a woman dies and they lower her into this big kind of like beige brown vat of decomposing stuff. And there's a guy who kind of looks like a priest and he's he's saying a he's reciting something about how she's going to be recycled and she will feed us and it's basically mm-hmm. turning this dead person into soil mm-hmm. so they can grow some tomatoes and that sort of thing. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, it would be a truly closed system. Yep. Uh, and a very rational, it would have to be very rational. So you wouldn't waste a perfectly good thing, mm-hmm. like a dead person. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's true. God, Keith, well, I don't know if this was an uplifting conversation or a completely depressing <laughs> conversation. <laughs> I, I think it uh, it comes around that the uh, at the moment the challenges probably outweigh the uh, the advantages to a self sustaining colony on Mars. And yes. uh, and now we can think about you know are there things we could learn that we can apply to to make our life better here. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, great. It's great. <laughs> and on that note, and on that note, <laughs> no, it's great talking to you as always, Keith. And uh, yeah, maybe we could do, fun. yeah, maybe we could do another one of those, ask the soil scientists some questions mm -hmm. uh, in the coming months. I think that would be, be worthwhile. I'd have to make sure that we hadn't, we weren't re I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of questions that people are going to ask every single time. Yep. Um, so, but I think it would still be worthwhile. Um, so if you're up to that, uh, we will give you a sure, ring. Sure. Sure. Yeah. We'll, uh, if, if, uh, if people are asking questions, it's, we're getting to what they want to know. So yes, that's absolutely. always useful. All right. <laughs> All right. Great, Keith. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, everybody out there, I hope you really uh, enjoyed this discussion. We kind of went all over the place, but it's something I wanted to delve into because I, I haven't heard any skepticism being applied to this proposition. All I've heard is people thinking, oh, this is so great. What a great thing. Let's do it. Right. And I just uh, everything, all of my thoughts when I've been hearing people talk about this is how, what, what are you talking about? How are you going to feed all these people? What are you going to do? You know, um, so I think it was uh, worthwhile to just play around with it. Maybe they'll be playing clips from this 10 years from now when there's 100 people living on Mars um, showing how wrong Keith and I were. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think our... <laughs> be, being Nothing wrong with being proven wrong. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Who knows, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, I think uh, my money's on you, Keith. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Everyone, thanks for watching this. Uh, Keith, thank you so much. And uh, until next time, everyone, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching. Hey, if you want to help support everything I'm doing here, go to Vessies.com to buy whatever you need for your garden this year. And use my coupon code GAVS23 to get free shipping as long as there's a pack of seeds in the order and there's no oversized items in the order. Check out the description box of this video for details. You can buy everything you need from Vessies. They have seeds, fruit bushes and trees, soil amendments, pest solutions, tools, clothing, and lots of other stuff too. So yeah, if you want to help support everything I'm doing here and they sell something you need, buy it from them using my coupon code and happy gardening.